actions, all leading to who we're becoming, and that's what we're talking about now. Ten weeks on virtues, character, who we are, wanting to be like Jesus based on our beliefs, based on our practices. Last week we began talking about love as the first and most important foundation for who we are. And today we're talking about joy. Uh, it's one of the gifts of the Spirit, one of the fruit of the Spirit uh, in Galatians chapter 6. Uh, it's an interesting topic, joy, on the first Sunday of Lent. Now, who here knew that it was Lent? Began the sort of this church season called Lent. It's a strange word, I know. It comes from way back. And it's this idea that there's a 40-day period of sort of preparation for Easter. A time of reflection, a time of penitence. And they actually used it in the ancient church as a time of preparing new converts and teaching them the faith. And then they were baptized at like 12.01, you know, the strike of midnight on Easter morning. And they were presented in their white garb. Anyway, so it's this idea of, of kind of penitence and self-reflection. It's, it's often seen as kind of a sour and dour time. If you come from a high church tradition like Roman Catholic or Episcopal or some Lutherans, you'll, you'll know something of what I'm talking about. They talk a great deal about fasting, about depriving yourself, giving something up, abstaining from something. This is kind of your religious duty, you know, during Lent. And, and so it's, a, it's an interesting theme to talk about during this time. I'm reminded of the story, uh, there was an Italian guy, he was a mayor of a little village in Italy. And he was just the, the standard bearer for that approach to Lent. And he wanted to control the people in that village and wanted them, he didn't want them to experience any joy, any pleasure, any delight whatsoever. So much so that he actually wrote the sermons for the local Catholic priest every Sunday. Directing the people to steer clear of anything that would bring delight. Well, as the movie that's based on that story would go, you probably know what I'm talking about in the movie Chocolat, uh, he, um, he, uh, he ran into this woman who, uh, she came into town, a stranger, in the middle of this scene, single mother which raised eyebrows to these highbrowed people, and she opened of all things a chocolate shop. <gasps> Gasp. Well, this guy did not like it. And he just upped the ante with his war against the delight in chocolate. So much so that, and I'm going to show you this clip here in just a moment. He, he just decides he's going to, he can't stand it. So he breaks into her shop in the middle of the night. He gets into her display case and he finds a three foot tall chocolate naked woman. Oh, double gasp. And as you'll see. He begins to slice it apart. He is not going to have this. But there's a surprise ending to his encounter in this little display case. So check out the scene from Chocolat.
can't get enough now. <laughs> they find him the next morning, passed out in a food coma in that display case. So here's the question, and this is the beginning of Lent for his village. Which is it? Which extreme is it? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Is it the joyless religious duty to abstain from joy and pleasure and fast and so on? Or is it the joyful delight in chocolate? Interesting quote. It helps us get at the answer to that question. This comes from Sheldon Van Alken. He said this, The best argument for Christianity is Christians. Their joy, their certainty, their completeness. When Christians are somber, when Christians are joyless, self-righteous, smug, narrow, or repressive, Christianity dies a thousand deaths. I think there are no truer words than that. I, I, and so, it's, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? This idea of joy during a season that traditionally wants to kind of suppress it. Well, what are we talking about anyway? The idea of joy. What is joy in the first place? Because there's, there has to be more to the picture, and then there really is. I want to share with you, one of the best places to start in discovering what it's about is in the Psalms. There are almost 300 places where joy is talked about in Scripture, and the Psalms depict it again and again. Three Psalms I want to share with you. One is Psalm 16, verse 11. It says this, and I want you to look for the thread of commonality, of continuity between each of these. You make, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. If you then go over to Psalm 21, verse 6, it says, Surely you have granted him unending blessings and made him glad with the joy of your presence. There's a word that's being used in addition to joy, that's common between those two, those two psalms. Psalm 43, verse 4. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my joy and my delight. I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. What's the common theme from one to the other there? Joy has to do with God's presence. Joy has to do with God's presence. You see, here's the challenge for us. We easily bypass real substance. God's presence in our lives in search of a feeling, usually the feeling of happiness. And there's a big difference between happiness and joy. Let me illustrate this with you with a little story. Um, it may be a surprising kind of story to illustrate this to you. Let me tell you about Claude Hopkins. Back in the early 1900s, Claude Hopkins was the guy who invented Pepsodent toothpaste. Now, toothpaste had been around in America before that, but Claude did something very interesting. He added that little tingle, that little feel that you get when you brush your teeth. You know how it is. Hopefully you brush your teeth this morning. If not, just move away from your neighbor. Uh, where you, you brush it, it feels fresh and tingling. You just kind of go, ah, and it feels great. It feels clean, right? Now, that feeling, that sensation was what was new. He didn't change the substance of toothpaste whatsoever. It cleaned teeth the same as it had always cleaned teeth. But the feeling is what convinced people in dramatic fashion to start brushing their teeth. It was such a problem back then. There were only 7% of American households that had toothpaste in the early 1900s before Pepsodent. It was such a problem, it became a national security concern because of all the new recruits in the military who had rotten teeth. Ten years after Claude Hopkins invented Pepsodent and put the little tingle in our toothpaste... 65% of American households had toothpaste. From 7% to 65%. Why? Because of a feeling. See, that's how we're oriented, and that's how marketing affects us. What we feel, feeling good, feeling happy, all those kinds of things. The tingle made it feel more effective, but guys, it didn't make it more effective. It just made it seem so. What's the lesson? There's a lesson, a fundamental lesson in this story. We often overfocus on things that make us feel good and under-focus on things that are really best for us. We over-focus on seeking out happiness and the feelings of happiness and the circumstances of happiness and under-focus, ignore really deep joy that's totally different from happiness. How's it different? Well, here's how it's different. Happiness depends on happy circumstances. Joy is not associated with circumstances whatsoever. Huge difference. Happiness is associated with feelings. The tingle of life that we're seeking in a million different ways, right? 
Happiness is elusive. Some of you get AARP magazine. Anybody here get AARP? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Um, really interesting cover picture. It's Bob Dylan, the man. Speaks for a generation, the Woodstock generation. He was interviewed. They, they, he, he ignored Rolling Stone. He ignored all these other magazines. He chose AARP, of all things, to do an interview with. And it's interesting, in this interview, they ask him about happiness. Let me tell you what Bob Dylan said about happiness. They asked, have you touched it? He said, well, we all do. Have you held it? They asked. He said, well, we all do at certain points, but it's like water. It slips through your fingers. As long as there's suffering, you can only be so happy. How can a person be happy if he has misfortune? Well, he's right, but the focus is the circumstances, right? He's telling us something that we know. Happiness is elusive because it's so dependent on whether we feel good. What's going on around us is good or not. So the whole feeling thing, that's a problem for us. But I want to suggest to you there might be an actual bigger problem for us when it comes to deep joy and, and getting past the happiness thing. And that is this. We're afraid of joy. I think many of us, if we're honest, are afraid of deep joy. Why? Because it seems too good to be true. You know, there's no free lunch, right? There, you, it's something that is that complete, that is that transcendent, can't be real. Or because we have gone down paths like this before and we've been disappointed. We've been in relationships where we've opened our hearts, we've been vulnerable, we have been affected by others only to have it trampled on and disappointment sets in. And so we guard it. We're not going to go there again. Or maybe we're just skeptical of all the overhyped promises in our society. And they are everywhere, aren't they? Everything promising everything. And so, is, how is this any different, Tim? Well, it's a wonderful insight that David Ford gives. He says this, Most of us are deeply distrustful of the possibility of joy. There is distrust at a fundamental level. We really don't want joy at a fundamental level because of the vulnerability on us, on our hearts, on our lives. I think he's right. But, why are we here? We're here because we worship a God who invites us again and again into new possibilities. New possibilities, not just for life hereafter, but life here and now. A God who is opening up new dimensions of what it means to come alive again and again, especially with joy. Below the surface of happiness, deep-rooted joy. Jesus perhaps has the last word on this, and literally at the end of his ministry, he's about to be arrested. This is in John 15, it's called the Upper Room Discourse, and he's giving the disciples his last words before he's about to, about to be taken. So they're important words. And he shares, them with them, he shares these words with them to be also shared with us. And listen to what he says in John chapter 15, beginning with verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now, remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. And then this is the really crucial verse. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My joy in you, your joy complete. Now, there are, in that one verse, and let's just keep it there for a second. In that one verse, there are some amazing gifts and promises for us to cling to and unpack. Let me, let me share a few of these with you. The first one is this. It is possible to have complete joy. You might be, as David Ford said, distrustful, doubtful, skeptical about this even be a possibility. You've gone down all these paths before. Oh, maybe you've tried different churches before. You've tried reading the Bible before. You've tried praying and nothing happens. And so, mm, stiff arm. Jesus, from his lips, he says, it is possible to have complete joy. All right, so there's a possibility there that's pretty exciting. Well, the next promise that he gives us is even more exciting, and that is this. God wants complete joy for you. It's not like God is just saying, I hope you get it. Good luck. He, he is in your camp. He's on your team. He wants it for you. And even more than that, God has given you the tools for complete joy. This idea of complete joy, by the way, the word in Greek for complete is the word for fulfill, 
full, filled completeness. God wants you to be fulfilled and complete. And then finally, he tells us implicitly that to have joy, complete joy, we borrow Christ's joy. In other words, it's not about what you can manufacture, even in a religious, pious sense. What you can put together to make yourself, to convince yourself. This is something that comes from God. He's giving you his joy. So it begs the question, what does Christ's joy look like? What does this joy that he's giving us look like? That's why it's so important to know the story of the Bible, the story of Jesus. Because it's not just about what he did, but it's about who he was that shapes who we are. He's giving us his joy. Remember, Jesus laughed and he cried. Jesus felt pain. He grew tired and angry. Jesus had deep stress and conflict. Anybody here identify with Jesus yet? Uh, In other words, Jesus was human. And he showed us how to be human in the best way. It, It wasn't just that he was a savior. He was. It wasn't just that he redeemed us from our sins. He did. But he showed us how to live life with deep, centered, rooted, anchored joy that makes a difference. He stayed connected through all of these human experiences and emotions doubt and loss and heartache. He stayed connected to the source of joy that sees past present circumstances. That's way different than the tingle of Pepsodent in this life. Than the feelings that we seek after in this life. How connected was he? He, he um, in John 15, 1, he said this. He uses this image, uh, a gardening image. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. Now think about the relationship between a gardener and a plant, a bush, a flower, what have you. It is, it is, it is absolutely important and necessary because if the gardener is not attending to it, not watering, caring for, fertilizing, it's going to die, right? It's a symbiotic relationship. Ultimately connected, intimately connected, necessarily connected in order for there to be life. That's the way relationship Jesus describes between himself and God the Father. How connected was he? That's how connected. So, how does this play out in Jesus' life? Remember the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus sees the cross ahead of him. Incredible torture and agony. He sees unbelievable heartache and loss and pain. Physical pain. Spiritual, mental pain. He begs He begs God, please, if this cup can pass, if I can avoid this, please. And in fact, the Gospel of John tells us that he sweats blood. Scientists have told us that you can actually be stressed out enough, anxious enough, that your pores open wide enough that blood can seep out. He was that stressed out and anxious. Yet, in the middle of that reality, not going around it, going right through the middle of it, he can easily pray, "Not, not my will, but your will. Even though... I'm feeling this. It's gut-wrenching. Not my will, but your will. That's how connected he was. Listen to the way the writer of Hebrews puts it. And this is just a phenomenal, phenomenal insight from Scripture. He's talking about the, the people of God first. And he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And here's the key. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, and this is it. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Joy was the difference maker. When he was forsaken by the Father, when he was going through so much pain and chaos and loss and grief and fear and all those things that we experience in life, joy in connection to the Father's love. Joy. What does it do? It gives you endurance. That's the gift of Jesus' joy for you in this life. It gives you endurance amidst difficulty. It gives you endurance amidst chaos and pain and confusion and stress. It's not just icing on the cake. It's the substance. Happiness is the icing on the cake. And we confuse those very easily. You see, here's the truth. You can handle anything in this life if the deepest well of your life is filled with God's joy. We have all these wells. Just use that image of a well or water. And we fill them with all kinds of experiences, all kinds of things, knowledge. But if God's joy is in the deepest well, 
You see, too often, too often we fill our deepest well with efforts to control circumstances or with our dysfunctional responses to circumstances. I want to unpack that a little bit for you. Uh, controlling circumstances, we, we tend to do that. You know, whenever we kind of hunker down and we're going to make this, make something of this, we're going to rearrange, we're going to... Remember Muhammad Ali? Muhammad Ali was, he was the rope-a-dope king. He was the greatest. I am the greatest. Float like a butterfly. Sting, what was it? Float like a butterfly. Sting like a bee. Something like that. I mean, his, he had an ego to match his record. He was the greatest. He was the champ. One day, there's a story about Ali. He's on an airplane. And um, as is the custom, the door's shut on the airplane. And they ask everyone to bus- buckle their seatbelts. He didn't buckle his seatbelt. The flight attendant comes by him and says, uh, Mr. Ali, you need to buckle your seatbelt. He says, you know who I am. I am the greatest. I'm the champ. I am Superman. Superman don't need no seatbelt. To which she responded, well, Superman don't need no airplane either. <laughs> what was he doing? He thought he was in control. As soon as turbulence would have hit, it doesn't matter who he was, right? He's not in control. That's delusional. We're like that. Maybe not on that extreme, but we're like, we think we're in control of our lives. We think we're in control of your health. Are you in control of your health? I mean, are you really? You can influence it, but are you really in control of your health? Ultimately. We think we're in control of our families. You think you're really in control of your kids? <laughs> we think we're in control of, you know, our careers and things can come without any warning from around the corner. Bam! You don't even know. And it can be, it can have to do with your health. It can have to do with your family impact your career. You're not ultimately in control. We think we make our way in life. And we do a lot of stuff to convince ourselves that we are really in control. But guys, you're not Superman. Neither am I. And you need an airplane. And guess what that airplane is? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. So, controlling circumstances, that can be one of our defaults. But the other one, and this is really insidious, is dysfunctional responses to circumstances. Uh, often we just kind of have a default mode of repeating and replaying negative family patterns again and again. And if you don't rehearse, learn and rehearse new positive patterns to become a transitional generation, you will replicate everything that's happened negatively in your family system, in your family tree throughout the years. And and if you're in a a 12-step program, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Negative patterns that are typical for us. Things like blaming behavior. Things like codependency, depending on others for your sense of worth and and identity. Things like over-focusing on others and not focusing on yourself. Interesting story in that regard. Uh, The pastor, one of of my my heroes, John Ortberg, um, met with his mentor, Dallas Willard. And He met with him, and he he wanted to get some advice from Dallas Willard about what he could do to fix his people's spiritual needs. You know, I mean, sort of good-hearted in a way, right? A pastor cares about, you know, a shepherd cares for the sheep. What can I do that would be helpful for them? What can I do that would change them, would bring them transformation, so on and so forth? And Dallas Willard had a response that Ortberg was not ready for. This is what he said. He said, John, you must arrange your life so that you are experiencing deep contentment, joy, and confidence in your everyday life with God. To which John Orberg said to him, Dallas, I don't think you understood my question. I I wasn't asking about me. I was asking about them. What can I do to them, for them, with them? To which Dallas said, no, I heard your question. I know exactly what you're asking. And I'm giving you the right answer. You see, ultimately it's not about them. It always starts with you. It's the case for a pastor. It's the case for a parent. It's the case for a spouse. It's the case for a friend. It's not about them. Them in the past, them in the present, them in the future. It's about you. Who are you bringing into this relationship? And so, for all of us, arrange your life that you may experience deep commitment, joy, and confidence in your everyday life with God. And when we do that for ourselves with God... The impact, of course, is obvious. It spills over into the lives of others. And that was the wisdom of Dallas Willard. So, let me ask you this question. You have all these wells in your life. To use that image, what's in the deepest well? 
What's in the deepest well? You remember the story of the woman at the well. Jesus, um, Jesus meets this woman at the well, and she's seeking fulfillment, right? She's seeking life. She, well, first, she's just seeking water to, to give her life. But Jesus is basically saying to her, you're, you're going down dead-end road to find the fulfillment that you're seeking. He, he reminds her that he's, you know, you have, you've had multiple husbands, right? And the, that symbolizes something. A, a, a seeking after worth and fulfillment. A seeking after a sense of security. Are we very different from her? We, we do that in a thousand different ways. Seeking worth and fulfillment and security. Well, and then, and then he's talking about the water that he's going to give her. But she, she thinks that he's talking about physical, literal water. And so she thinks, this is magic water. I want some of that. What's... What does that symbolize? Her seeking to be in control of her health. Receiving good fortune. Don't we do that? Don't we do that? And so, Jesus, he has to clarify it. And he says these words to her in Matthew, or rather in John chapter 4. Jesus answered her, Everyone who drinks this water, the physical water in the well, will be thirsty again. Isn't that the case? But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now, guys, we're in Florida. We know about springs, right? You guys ever been to any of the springs? You know what the blowhole is? That's where the, the spring water comes up. And I guarantee you, 365 days a year, the water will be just as clear on any day, it will be the exact same temperature any day. It will be the exact same volume of water any day, regardless of what's happening on the surface. Regardless of the weather outside, regardless of the other influences that come onto that spring. Why? Because it's constant, it's never-ending, it's consistent, and it comes from within deep. And nothing can dilute it. And that's the image of Jesus. And what he's, this is not just a sip to satisfy you. It's not just the, the Pepsodent tingle. This is something deep from within that is constant and never ending. And we thirst for that. We don't even know. Like the woman at the well, we seek after this, but we don't really know what we're seeking after. And we settle for less. But this water that Jesus is referring to is nothing less than his joy rooted in God's love. His joy rooted in God's love. And as we connect to God's love in Jesus Christ, we get connected to the power grid of God's joy, of Christ's joy. The power grid, the electricity of it that energizes our life, that makes the difference, that brings life. I heard a news story this week about India. In rural places in India, there are 300 million people that are not connected to the power grid of electricity in India. Can you imagine that? The United States of America has something like 470-something million people. So more than three-quarters of the population of the United States, can you imagine having no electricity? And all the quality of life circumstances that that would bring about, the absolute degradation and difficulty that that would bring for life, not truly living. Well, that's really what Jesus is getting at for us spiritually. We can survive like they can survive without power without electricity, but we can't survive well by God's design, according to God's intention, without the spiritual electricity of God's joy in Jesus. Now, on top of all this, Jesus goes on to make a ginormous promise. I wouldn't even share this with you if he didn't actually say it, because it's, it's pretty profound. Jesus is just about to go He's about to be arrested. He knows that the disciples are going to really face a hard time. He knows that they are going to be grief-stricken, confused, lost. And so he forecasts it, and he says to them these really important words in John 16, verse 22. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. There's a promise. There's a covenant. No one will take away your joy. Nothing can rob God's joy from you. That's not just for them. That was for all, all of the disciples that follow, all the way down to you and me. No one can take away your joy. 
Lisa and I, my wife and I, had um, had a friend visit this week, and uh, it was it was an amazing time. He's a, a dear old friend of mine. We we were uh, served in a church together in Virginia back in the in the nineties, and uh, he's a music guy, and he's he had to get back for his church. His wife died a year ago this March. He's my age. She was my age. Her name was Virginia. Steve and Virginia. And I hadn't seen him since she was diagnosed in 2011 with ALS. Now, I don't know if you know anything about ALS, but the stories that Steve shared with us confirmed that it's probably the most horrific way for a loved one to go. It, it, your, your body just sort of deteriorates while your mind stays intact, basically. And, and he began to describe his two boys who were in college, left college to come home to spend the last, you know, six months with their mom. And, and the way that they had to help her, just these horrific, gut-wrenching situations. And just the despair and all oh, the heartache and the loss. And so he's coming up on a year. And you would think, you would think in the conversation as he's sharing that, if you were looking on from the outside and say the volume was muted, you wouldn't think that he was telling the kinds of stories he was telling about this horrific situation. Why? Because my friend Steve has a well of joy in Christ that's deeper than the pain and the heartache that he experienced, that sustains him. And, and, and he's, he's effervescent with joy. Not because he's sidestepped difficulty. Not because he's in denial of the reality of the absolute heartache that he's gone through. But because the well of joy is deeper still. Isn't that what you want? That's what I want. That's what God wants for us. And that is possible for us. So, if you want that, I'm going to end this talk with three practical suggestions. You may want to write these down. I think they're real simple, and this is a way for us to grow deeper in our, jo- our experience of joy, really and truly in our life. Here are three practices for you to consider. One is, regularly rehearse all God has brought you through. That's simple. Anybody can do that. And the longer you live, the better it gets because you have more and more to draw on. My wife and I sit down, and very often we'll talk about, what, look at what God has done in our life. I mean, look at that pain. Look at that situation. Look at that dead end. Look at that heartache. Look at, and God brought us through it. Rehearse that. Share that with a loved one. Journal about it. Let it be a constant reminder for you of God's faithfulness. Yes, God is the one that brought us through that. Rehearse that again and again. The second practice is this. Regularly serve people who need joy. Regularly serve people. That may sound like a strange one to you, but it really isn't. Because when you serve others, it's like looking in a mirror. When you serve them with joy, it's a reflection that comes back to you. Let me share a little anecdote with you. A pastor named Judd Willite is a pastor in Nevada. And he shares about one of his parishioners. And this is what he says about her in this way. He says, my friend Judy is 80 years old and still going strong. She lights up rooms when she enters, an incredible life giver and encourager. She serves at least five days and two nights a week in our church's care ministry and recently made her 10,000th personal phone call, personal care phone call to people in our church. And he has in parentheses, yeah, you read that right, 10,000th. She volunteers in our church's recovery ministry and leads recovery groups in jails and prisons here in Nevada. She does all this and more, not to perform for God or to earn her salvation, but out of gratitude for the gift of God's joy and grace that she has received. You know, when you you serve others with joy, those who need it, guarantee you, it's like looking in a mirror, comes back at you. And the third suggestion is this. Third suggestion is regularly immerse yourself in God's promises of love, grace, and joy in the Bible. In other words, learn the story. Learn the story. Not because it's good knowledge to have, because it shapes you. It's the truth for you. That's the difference. Why do we do this Wednesday night, Believe Family Night? Because guess what? You might not think so, but we're just scratching the surface right now with this topic. When we come together, we get to dive deeper. We get to unpack it more fully. 
and apply it to our lives more deeply. In other words, it changes us. It transforms us. It's an amazing gift as we come together. I encourage you to do so. So, God wants, God wants to fill your deepest well with his joy, to make your joy complete. It's possible. He makes it possible. He wants it for you. My friends, don't ever settle for less. Amen? Amen. And amen. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this amazing gift, for joy that is unending, for the deepest well that you stand ready to fill. And we ask, O oh God, that you would remove the obstacles, the barriers, our fears, our mistrust, our experiences, both in religion and otherwise, in relationships, our heartaches, that would keep us from, from being filled by you. Come to us through your Spirit.